As a pastor and counselor, I've spent the better part of my life equipping and training others. My goal with this show is to translate my hard-earned experience into tools and tactics to help you become stronger as a man. This is the Brave Co. Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Bellet. Hey, Brave Co. Men, if you are looking for the ultimate adventure, we have the thing for you. It's our Brave Co. experience happening October 23rd through the 27th. We are going to spend four days together as men hanging out having a blast. You're also going to learn how to shoot long range. So if you've never learned how to shoot long range before and you like shooting guns, this is the ultimate adventure. We shoot out to 1400 yards. If you have your own gun, you can bring your own gun. If you don't actually own your own rifle system to shoot out that far, we have one for you. And if you've never shot a rifle before, but you want to try and learn, no problem. Even if you don't know how, we'll teach you all of the skills that you need to do this. We also do uh, high ropes courses. There will be a a ton of connection time, really good food, professional chefs that we hire to come out there and cook for us. The stuff is great. So if you're looking to get out, have an incredible time, go to braveco.org, check out our events page, and you can see what's coming up there. Hey man, welcome back to the Brave Co. podcast. This week, I'm excited for this podcast. I have one of my best friends on the podcast this week, and his name's Jeff Sawyer. Bro, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, after you begging me for years to come on the podcast. (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) Yeah. It's actually the opposite. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So if Jeff had his way, um, he would just, he'd just be working all day. All day. Yeah, dude. So. Bro, you have um, a crazy story. You're. Uh, just to set it up, like you're one of the most incredible men that I know. You're such a great father. You're such a loyal friend. And you just, yeah, you've, you, I'm always inspired by you, bro. You're always working so hard. You're loving your family, loving those kids. And just a, just a kind of a, a funny story to start. Jeff has seven daughters and he married this beautiful Mexican girl, right? You better say Spanish. Spanish. Yeah. Oh, is that wrong? Yeah. And it's I'm a big just doing my best. It's a bro. big just, thing. I don't know why. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just trying to like paint the picture because we don't have a picture of your wife. Yeah. <laughs> and so they start having kids. And then I'm I'm like telling some of your story, but they start having kids. You had five kids and you you like wanted to try for a boy. Yes. And uh, then we had twins. True. Twin girls. Yeah, twin girls. <laughs> the doctor didn't want to tell me what twin B was. <laughs> <laughs> She got choked up a little bit. <laughs> Seven girls in the house. So this is what I'm saying, guys. Like, this yeah. is a man's man. I remember sometimes you'd call me and be like, bro, I got to get out of here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I always appreciate it when you called. <laughs> it's kind of isolated down there in Cottonwood. Yeah, dude. You know, so. But dude, I want to talk. Uh, I want to dive into your story, like how you grew up in guys are going to hear your story today and just feel really inspired by your life and what you went through. You've got, you've had some crazy circumstances in your life. It's a really cool story. So I want to, want to take guys back to like, where were you born? What was life like for you? How'd you grow up? Well, I was born in New Jersey, but we moved to Lancaster down LA when I was like one. Which is in California. Yeah, California. So I just grew up, it was, uh, you know, my parents were divorced by the time I was one and, um, of course, I had a stepdad that was, you know, a little, a little on the edge all the time. I Did th- you live with your biological dad? Never, no, never. No, he uh, he lived in the same town as us, but uh, we saw him maybe once a year. Wow. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was a, it was an interesting situation. But um, just growing up, you know, I was I was a kid. I couldn't speak. You know, I was uh, had to go to the little yellow bus. That whole thing. You uh, couldn't speak. No, I, I had a hard time. I knew how to say it, but it was it was a lot of work, you know. Because of anxiety, or do you I don't know? know. It was you know, my, you know, my stepdad. He would hit me in the head and stuff because I, you know, if I wanted something to eat, I didn't know what to ask, how to ask for it. Wow! But it was in there, you know what I mean. So he was just—it was just different. He was—he was something else. He, he would like you know take wire hangers and untwist them and whip us with them. No way! 
hold us under water and stuff. And I've watched him drown things like cats and mice. And he was pretty, he was pretty wow. wild. So growing up, it was kind of tough like that, you know? Yeah. Um, What'd your mom do when all that stuff happened? My mom turned her turned the other way. Yeah. I think she was in a position where she was, uh, she felt like she was grateful to have some, a, a guy in the house that was, uh, kind of handling things you yeah because she didn't know what she was doing yeah she she grew up kind of rough her her dad used to beat her mom and stuff so um like abuse wasn't abnormal to her yeah right so it was just i was we were always scared my my brother and i growing up you know i i uh i had a guy um when i was like six seven years old uh take me out of the bowling alley and um he was going to get me some quarters. And I said, you know, I saw him naked and he took me to some trailer park. And then um, when he dropped me off, I was too scared to tell anybody when I walked in because I didn't want to, I didn't want to get in trouble. You know oh, what I mean? Man. So I don't know exactly. I can't remember exactly what went down, but I could tell you exactly what the guy looks like. Yeah. But it was just growing up around that house, you know, with him in the house, it was, we were just scared, you know, all the time. It was, um. It was also in the Jehovah Witness, you know, congregation, that whole thing, you know, growing up the weird kid that can't stand up, say the Pledge of Allegiance, has to go home during Christmas parties and stuff, you know, <laughs> house getting egged on Halloween night, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Because so you're a Jehovah's a, Witness. Yeah, you know, so there's a lot going on, you know. I was just like, man, I just remember the last beating I took from that that dude. Uh, I... um. I had it out with uh, Jehovah one night. I was just walking the streets, you know, and about a year later, so he was gone. Wait, wait, wait. You know? No. So, yeah. how old were you? Uh, I think I was like 13. You are 13. At that time, yeah. And you you got in a fight with your dad? Uh, stepdad. Stepdad, yeah. sorry. What happened? Well, not even getting a fight. He He's just, uh, he like I said, he was really physical. I used to... <laughs> I know this is crazy, but I used to kind of like lock myself in the bathroom and beat the crap out of myself because I, I was afraid to break anything or do anything because it would be worse coming from him. Wow. You know what I mean? It was just a, just a kind of a, yeah, it wasn't fun, you know, just hungry all the time, you know. Because you guys didn't have food. Didn't have food. My mom didn't want to um, get any help from anybody, you know, at school and stuff. It's like everybody got the free lunches and stuff, the tokens and Brother and I just like, wow, everybody's eating, you know, we're just, just one of those lives, you know, we kind of grew up like that. So he, he was a, he was a trash man. You know? So at 13 years old, yeah, you, uh, you had it out with your dad? Step, no, Stepdad, I, no, I, I never had it out with him because I was yeah. scared of him. Uh, I had it out with Joe. <laughs> with God. Know? Yeah, I took God. Yeah, God, I just took off down the street. I remember walking that street just. I thought I was going to, God, Jehovah was going to zap me right there. Cause I, you know what I mean? Cause I was like letting it all out, you know, like I was letting it out. Because you're a Jehovah witness. Like that's all you knew. Right. God. At the time. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. so there's a lot going on, with, you know, kids, you know, I had, I had worms in my gut crawling out of my body, you know, and stuff. It was just, gosh, just so, it was just, you know, and then, and then after um, that whole thing, um, after about a, a year or so, my mom mourning, she cried all day and night every day, you know. She started going to the bars and stuff, so we were free. Was your stepdad still in the house? No, because at 14, they, they split up. Wow. I, I felt like it was divine, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah, dude. he's gone, baby. It was like out of jail. We were out of jail. That's what it felt like, you know. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you don't have to be locked up to be doing time, you know. So, God. Oh, so... Anyway, so it's like freedom, right? And so, you know, I got into, you know, I joined a gang. I was walking through a park one night, and these guys surrounded me, and they, were, they had 40s, which is beer, yeah, bold English, and they were break dancing. And I used to like to like, try to break dance and pop and lock. And they're like, hey, man, we'll pick you up tomorrow night, you know? And next thing you know, I'm, I'm going around gang banging, <laughs> you know? It's, yeah. It's pretty wild. What, lived that what did that life look like? Uh, living in hotel rooms, uh, just doing bad things all the yeah. time, you know, getting in fights, getting shot at, you know, had a gun to my head, you know, my it's crazy dude, just, just all kinds of things, you know, big get, gang, big gang fights. Getting big, shot at. Big gang fights. Yeah. Tell me about a gang fight. Um, uh, one. I mean. Well, you know. It's or, just, or nine, you okay, know. I don't I know. know. Well, there was one specific one. We were at a, um. We were at In-N-Out Burger, and uh, 
I was the last one in. A group went in, and uh, this guy, uh, I heard him. He, he called us a bad, called me a bad name. This is what they called us, you know. And so I was like, "Oh man!" I looked at Chino. I said, "Hey, these guys are out here, you know." And uh, come out, and it was like click, click, click. Like five, six cars. All these, all these folks came out of the car. Right? It was like five, six of us. And was it a rival gang? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, after that, uh, our boys were at the skating rink, and they pulled in. So now it's like. 30 to 40 on 30 to 40 in the parking lot. Oh my gosh. Gang signs are going up, you know, crazy stuff. And um, one guy on the other side gets in his car and he just starts running over everybody, you know, just hitting anybody he can. And I remember he came right up at Chino and Chino jumped up because my boy he jumped up and kicked the windshield and went rolling off. And then a buddy on my side, he had a gun, just starts popping off at the gun, at the car. And my, I see my best friend jump in a trash can, you know, and I'm jumping underneath the. <laughs> I'm jumping underneath the car. It was just really intense. Everybody was just fighting, you know? So we chased the guy. They we got him down on um, the boulevard, and we made him cry and had the gun to him and all that. And Jeez. It was intense, you know? How old were you? Uh, 17 at the time, I think. It was interesting. I went through that phase, and then... Uh, what What made you... Did you get out of it? Well, yeah. See, um, Sue, Sue was pregnant and i got caught up in palmdale well where did you meet sue i met sue at courts Hill high school yeah which is it's was it like cast. love at first sight yeah really uh-huh yeah it's like i asked her to wear a hat in class and i think she liked that but she didn't let me wear it and then after class i was like can i get your number <laughs> she said no <laughs> and she left and then the next day, she come walking up and handed it to me. That's awesome. So I'm like, you did your research, did you? <laughs> did she know that you were in a gang? No. No. She'll tell you that, too. But then she eventually did. And that's uh, and then I got caught up uh, at a at a 7-Eleven late one night. And I got jumped pretty good. And she was there. And uh, she got out of the car. And she's yelling at him to stop. How many guys? There was uh, four guys there. Bro, you can't take four guys. Man, I was getting kicked in the face. <laughs> dirt. I got two fake teeth right now. No bro. way from yeah, that. Yeah. And uh, that was the breaking point. I was going to go way deep or get out. Yeah. So um, I got jumped out. What does that mean? What did that mean? Well, I mean, I know you what get, that means. You, but... get, uh, you get initiated out of the gang when you get jumped out. You get jumped in, you get jumped out. So did you, when you got jumped in. Yeah. Did you like go tell the guys I want to be in the gang, and then they beat you up? Yeah, yeah. What Lucky was, for me, I lived. It was it was five fifty second Street, and not one hundred and fifty second, because they jump you for like fifty two seconds. Right? Oh no way! Right. So did uh, you get beat up bad? Yeah, coming in. Uh, not too bad. Jumping out when I got jumped out, I was uh, I was more aggressive. I've been in a lot of fights in between, so I felt like I did better on the way out. Because you can fight back. Right. Got then, it. Then the way in, you know, so. But that was it. And then I, I got out and moved up here. Sorry, I know I'm asking you a lot of questions. That's all right. But bro, you're like, you're skipping us through your life. I know, man. It's just it's good. It's been a crazy ride. Were you living at your mom's house when you were in the gang? Yes. And another story, if you want to hear it, um, we were at a, a hotel because that's where we were staying. The cops showed up and. Cop pulled out a gun and he threw it on my boy uh, Chino's seat of his car and goes, Chino, you got a gun in your car. <laughs> Looks like you're going downtown. And the cop looked at me and he's like, you want to go? And Chino's like, man, just go. Because he was staying with me at my house, you know. He had a place to live. So I was like, all right. And then the other cop goes, okay, you're going to go home, but you're going to run home. So he made me run like four miles with his light on me. <laughs> no All the way, way home to my house, which... Uh, I'm being no it's to me. Six a.m. the next morning, they raided my house because I took them to my house. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, what did your mom do? Oh, she was freaking out. She's like, "His dad works right over there. Go to him." So that was funny. So that's that's another whole thing. All my stuff is like on the local news. My hats, my clothing, all that good stuff. Did your mom? So she knew that you're in the gang. Yeah, after that. Did she talk to you about it? No, she didn't really care. She started dating a biker, a biker um, dude, and then 
that whole thing went crazy. It was almost all of us again, all, all his biker dudes, you know, because that got it, that got heated. Just a lot of stuff, you know, growing up. Bro, that's so, so crazy. Yeah. Like your mom doesn't care that you're in a gang. She's in this freaking biker gang. Not a biker gang. She, like she was biker. dating a biker guy, you know, he, ex-vet, you know, yeah. on the edge all the time, you know, one of those guys that yeah. snaps yeah, like that, you know. Um, but, yeah, they both passed now. Um, after that whole thing, though, that guy left my mom, and my mom just cried for weeks. So I just called him up, and I was like, hey, man, my mom needs you. I'm out. Don't worry about us. So they ended up getting married. They were married for like 30 years. That biker? Uh-huh. No way. Yeah. So if it, got, it all got better, right? Yeah. I grew up. I moved up here. Things ch- changed for me drastically. And so can we go back? Like you got out of the, you got jumped out of the gang mm-hmm. and you married Sue. Is that what happened? Yeah. We, um, we came up here. Right. Why'd you come up to Reading? Well, her sister moved up here. And, um, after we had Shanice, our oldest, Sue was only 17. I was 19. Her mom was on her and she wanted out of the house. Right. Did she have a good upbringing? Sue? Yeah. She had an okay. Yeah. Yeah, her dad, you know, was an alcoholic, I guess. and But he was really cool, really cool dude. And her, her mom's really nice. Uh, they had a nice, I think they had a nice family. You know what I mean? Yeah. They went out to dinner and stuff, which I'd never seen growing up. So I was like, wow, this is cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's Why'd why. she stay with you? I don't think she really knew me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think And then so it was either, too late. <laughs> <laughs> she'd been with you for too long yeah you know so yeah so it's really her mom's fault really i'm gonna blame it on her mom are you and her dad because like you know if you want to see where i grew up right and uh she's, she'll be so mad if she sees this and i'm telling this but Probably uh, won't even tell her that we her did mom this. her parents came and picked me up i think i told you this right they came down my street and picked me up. If I came down my street and stayed on me staying out there, I would have kept going. <laughs> I wouldn't have stopped. Because <laughs> they picked me up to go camping in Tahoe. Oh, no way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they did. And then when we got there, I realized that I was the babysitter, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Watching the kid, her Because they left to go to Reno. To no go to way. The, the casinos and left us alone in Tahoe. And she's 16, I'm 18. It's like, wow. What do you want to do? Well, that tells you a little bit about her parents, bro. You're right. Did you get her pregnant then? I think probably. So I mean, we're I mean, we're out in the trees. Yeah, dude. Not, what do you want to do? <laughs> right. It was just you and her. Just us. No way. Yeah. Was she a single kid? Uh, no, she has uh, she has other siblings. Yeah, yeah. But they just picked up. She's you the baby and her. She's the baby and yeah. left you guys together. Left us there. In the trees in North Tahoe, no not even way. South Tahoe, North Tahoe. We went, we we went to the movie theater. I remember it's kind of cool. We went and saw Gremlins, and uh, we, they came in and turned the lights off. And it was a clicker, click. Okay, movie starting. No way. Yeah, that's cool. But uh, yeah, um, they left us alone. So that's why I'm always blaming her mom because her mom, when she found out she was pregnant, she caught me down at the barn. And I, her fingers, she's only four eleven, like ninety pounds. But when she put that finger out in front of my face, it was like this log. <laughs> what she said? She you? said, and I kid you not, I hope you have nothing but daughters. Kid you no not. No way. Kid you not. Yep. She, she caught you in the barn. She cornered you. Yeah. She was so pissed. She was mad. Yeah. And you guys weren't married then? No, we were kids. I remember I was kind of working for her dad on and off because he was a plumbing contractor down in LA. And I went to work with him. And, uh, it was so early. So he left at four every morning. So I was just laying in the back seat. All of a sudden I hear, I don't see how you got her pregnant. I just sat up. <laughs> they didn't tell me. They told them. That was it. It was quiet. What'd you say to him? I didn't say anything. I didn't know what to say. I wanted to live. I just sat there and he would show up all the way to work, you know, and didn't say anything. That was it. No way. Yeah, that's all he ever said. So. So, bro, when you found out that your girlfriend's pregnant. Mm-hmm. She's 16 years old. Mm-hmm. You're 18. Uh, I was 19. 19. Yeah. Which I think is illegal. It, yes. But I don't know. Maybe. It, it is. Uh... <laughs> it's way past the statute of limitation. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, how scared were you? I was scared. 
Were you? I was scared and, and, uh, you were too dumb to be scared. I was, uh, I guess. Were you scared? First thing I thought of was like, man, I'm going to have to get five jobs. (laughs) That's the first thing that came to my mind. I I have to work the rest of my life. I got to work now. I have this child coming in, you know? So that was my first thing is, man, I got to make sure I do this right. How old are you now? Uh, 53. 53. Yeah. So I, I had, um, I got married at 18, was engaged at 17 in high school, and had my first son at 19, which means that my wife was pregnant at 18. Yeah. So I was having the same experience that you're having, except right. for I was married and my wife wasn't 16. Right. But I remember thinking, like I remember having a day, I was working for my dad and um, rebuilding air conditioning compressors for cars. And I remember just being in the back shop. I'm 18 years old. My wife's pregnant. And I was like, I am going to work till I'm 40 years yeah. old. Till I'm 40. Right. That, I was doing yeah. the math, right? right. Like, he's. I'm going to work till I'm 40. <laughs> right. It was a terrifying feeling. Right. It was. Yeah, I remember. I didn't know what was, I didn't know what to do. What'd you do? I started working. I just I did. I just went to work. Did you finish high school? I didn't. I dropped out in ninth grade. Yeah, I did. Started working. That's, did? that's when, that's when my mom, you know, got a divorce, and yeah. I started working because, you know, she needed help, and uh, you know, and that's but that didn't last very long. It was at a liquor store, and stuck on the shelves, and so that basically I just dropped out. But I did go to school the first month of the next three years. I tried, but it just didn't work out. Wow, you know, and that's when I met Sue. Was in that first month of one of those years no way yeah yeah so did you start working for her dad full-time is that what no i don't know i never did just part-time here and there no when uh the cops raided my place when we went over to my dad's work my dad had no idea of any of this because i didn't grow up with him you know he went and he adopted three other kids they had their own life and Whoa. you know um so they gave me a job what, doing what? Electrical. Oh. Yeah, that's how I got into it. You're an electrician now. Electrician. Just for every, I mean, I know that, but yeah. the funny thing is, is I don't know your story. Like, I've never heard all these stories. Yeah. I heard the story about Sue's mom Yeah, telling you, I hope you have girls. Right, right. So this is like fascinating. Yeah. So, so you started, you started in like just a grunt running around carrying tools or, or yeah pretty much the journeymen were like yelling down uh measurements and they just had me bending pipe and i was just setting it up that's all i was doing so uh, yeah so things went down on that but you know i got through that my dad they, they put me out at this uh edwards air force base on a job and uh and uh, I remember sitting there looking at this kid about my age and he's like man i can't believe i'm getting 27 bucks an hour and they were paying me five <laughs> because uh, on a prevailing wage job, you're yeah. supposed to be getting a prevailing wage yeah. job, but they were paying me five. I'm like, man, this dude hasn't been around my whole life and they're still working me. All all these gentlemen are calling me the numbers because I had it down, you know, yeah. I'm doing my thing. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to clean up my life. I'm doing good, you know, and, and they were working me. So I got into it big with my pops then and, you know, he said, don't ever talk to me again and all this stuff. But then he came around after I had my first daughter and it got better. So you left that job? I did. I had uh, another offer from another electrical contractor that went in business. And uh, he was going to pay me more money. And I, I liked working with him. Did you have like, you just had experience. You didn't have like any credentials? Nothing. Yeah. I just learned everything on the job. Yeah. Yeah. How long did you work for your dad? Oh, a couple of years. I think so, it was. Got it. So then you yeah. went and worked for this other guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was that was a where what town were you? In? That was Lancaster. Lancaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And were you married now to Sue? When I was working, no, I didn't marry Sue until I moved up here. No way. Yeah. So you were just with her. Yeah, just with her. With yeah. did you guys live together? No. Did she have the baby? Uh, we moved up here, I believe, a couple of months after she was born. Okay, so this is all before she was born, right? Or before you got her pregnant, right? Got it. Right. All about that time. Yeah. Well, kind of a blur. It's been a while. So when you you basically got your feet, you got your foot in the door and into electrical, mm-hmm. 
And then you got Sue pregnant, moved up yeah. here. <clears throat> yeah. I, during the time I was uh, doing electrical, it wasn't like the contract I worked for wasn't full time all the time. So I got into carpet cleaning. So I got into uh, that a lot. And then when I moved up here, there was no electrical job, but there was a carpet cleaning job. Oh, no way. So then I got into that up here for a while. And, um, and that, 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 that was okay. That was a lot of work, yeah. you know, but I was working with this old timer, you know, and, uh, he was, he taught me a lot about the different oak trees. He had me bucking hay. I didn't even know what bucking hay was. Yeah. Right? He was like 90 pounds. Well, that was a very big guy. Right. And he's taking these bells of hay and he's just throwing them. <laughs> right. And I'm like, give me that. Oh, I'm dragging it on my knee. I'm like, How is he doing that? That little guy, you know, but, he had me doing that, irrigating his pasture and stuff, stuff I never have done. Wow. You know? I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Yeah. But then, um, and then uh, the whole thing, uh, and then I, <clears throat> the whole thing with Sue went down. There was, you know, there was some things that went down, you know, so I left. No, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, just, you know, the, the, you know, in the mirror, some things went down, you know. So you got married. Got married, yeah. I had, had some kids and you know, some things between Sue and I, you know, life stuff, you know, she, we were both kids when we got married and yeah. stuff. She hit 21 and her dad had passed. And so things changed and, you know, and, um, you know, some things happened with us. And so I, I left for four Just years. like disconnected. Yeah, I guess so. I guess what it was, I, um, a buddy of mine put one to start a, a Sawyer complete carpet care. So I had a little carpet cleaning business for a while, you know, and, um, Who's, whose idea was it to separate? Was it your idea or hers? Yeah, um, it was mine. And yeah. Yeah, I was, it was hurt. It, I was hurt pretty bad, so I took off. Yeah. You know what I mean? I couldn't, um, it, it was the manner of way it was done. Yeah. Um, you know, so. So you left. So I left because I, I, I didn't, I didn't want to be here anymore because it was too hard. I didn't like her at the time and stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I yeah. left, so it hurt a lot. So I uh, took off for like four years. Wow. Yeah, I was gone. I was living the life. Did you see the kids? Well, on and off. So let's back up a little bit. Uh, the 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 lady that I, the old man, that the carpet cleaning business, she always was like, you know, hey, uh, I'm praying for you today. We praying for you today. You know, after a year or so of that, I was like, okay, what are you talking? You know, let's talk. She kind of knew I grew up J Dub. Even though I wasn't practicing as, as a J J Dub, I call them J Dubs. <laughs> you know, I always felt they were right. I was just a yeah. backsliding J Dub, so to speak. You yeah. know what I mean? But then she asked, you know, hey, you know, what can I pray for you about and stuff? So I, I started talking to her. And next thing you know, I went to her church and I was kind of feeling it. You know, I was like, oh, this is kind of cool, but, uh, I didn't really get into it at the time. Um, and then when that went down with Sue, about that time, uh, a friend of mine invited me to Bethel. And that's when I first went to Bethel, back oh. in 95, 96. Yeah. Something like that. I was 16. Yeah. Right back then. And uh, I was in the choir. I jumped into choir. Bro, can you sing? No. Mark had, take, Mark Holt had take me, anybody? Mark Holt had me saying watermelon the whole time. He goes, just say, just move your lips. Just say watermelon back there. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I was just trying something yeah, out. Dude. You know, You're I was just being like, a part. You're part but, of the gang, the choir gang. But I didn't, I didn't deal with the, I didn't deal with what went down. Yeah. So when, um, that dude came through after Bill came in and Basil Howard Brown came in. Oh, some speakers at Bethel. Basil Howard Brown. Yeah. Uh, when all that went down, I was in the church. When that went down, I was sitting there. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that was interesting because I was like, wow, this is wild. Like the power of God came into Bethel? No. No, like this guy got up in front of me on the chairs with his Bible open and went down to the front, started rebuking Basil Howard Brown out for, up front. Dude, I That's never heard that. The church, no, no, I, I never the heard that. church split overnight. You don't remember that? No, dude. Like right after the past. I remember Bill's first words. He took a deep breath. He said, well, I guess I'll find out who the churchgoers are. Bro, so, okay, so he had a guest speaker. Yeah. Basil Howard Brown. 
Mm -hmm. And a guy got up and started mm -hmm. rebuking uh -huh. the guest speaker. Mm -hmm. And then half the church got up and left. Well, not at that moment. Because yeah. there was there was some aggression up front, right? No way. Yeah, right? There was some arguing. There was some stuff. I was there. And um, the pastor that married Sue and I, he caught me. I, I don't know. He was just there. He caught me in the hallway. And he's like, are you confused, Jeff? And I was like, yeah, I kind of am. And he's like, you know, God's not a God of confusion. You sure you belong here? Wow. Yeah. I uh, it, it was just so much. I didn't deal with Sue, with everything with my wife. Yeah. And, and now this was going on and, you know. And it's like wow, a church split. It's just too much, you know. So I left. I was gone. So I left. And I had a great time those those four years. Where'd you go? I went down to L.A. I had a girlfriend, you know, a couple of girlfriends. I just took off. When you say you had a great time, I mean. I, par I partied. Yeah. You know, I, went, I was on the edge. You know, I was going places with my buddies and doing like stuff. drugs or some drugs. Yeah, yeah. I was living. I was like, I'm out of here. I'm never going back, anyways. It doesn't matter. And then, um, I know I probably skipped over a ton of stuff. No, and then good. I came up here one day. I was seeing this girl down there in Oakland because I hadn't moved around, and I was uh, managing GNC. I uh, just left SAC because I was wanting houses there. And my buddy was like the regional sales manager for uh, GNC in the Bay. So he's like, hey, I'll give you a store if you want to get out of SAC. So I went down there and started seeing this girl. And it was going really, really good. I really liked this girl. She was cool. And um, she's like, you need to go see what's going on with your divorce. So I came up here. I went to my the paralegal. It was out of business. I was like, out of business? So I go to the courthouse and I go in. I say, I'm just checking up, following up on my paperwork because I know it's my paralegal. She goes, oh, no, she never refiled. They're still 100% married and all that. No way. Yeah. So I was like, oh, man. I left going, man, that's crazy. And I was going down. I was going east on 44. And I happened to notice my oldest daughter in, the, in my sister-in-law's car right next to me. And my oldest daughter was just looking out the window. Broke me up. Wow. Yeah, big time because I hadn't been around. I was like, man, I got, I got to do something. So I sucked it up. I was like, man, I, I got to come back, and I didn't want to come back. Did not want to come back. And so, but I did. I was like, I remember telling them, my kids, hey, I'm, I'm coming home. I had no idea Sue was in your dad's home group this whole time. No way. Yeah, and um. I can't tell how many people that were in that home group that uh, said they, they were praying for me the whole time that I ran into, you know, year, you know, after I came back, years after I came back. Um, but um, when I told the girls I was coming home, it was like 10 Christmases in one. They were jumping up and down. And Bro, had stuff. you talked to Sue and told her? I told her. What did she I, say? She was, she was, she was, she was waiting for me. Oh, wow. Yeah, she was, she was waiting for me. She and she had a promise. She she was told the promise, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I was, you know, your dad's home group. Whoever's all those all those prayers, and you know what was going on because I was never coming back here. Wow, you know, and uh, so, anyways, um, yeah, I told my kids. They were like so excited, jumping up and down. This is great, Dad, man. And because my oldest, she was hiding food. We found out underneath her bed and stuff, you know. And I was like, man. I've been so selfish, but I was so hurt. I didn't want to deal with any of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So anyways, um, so I went back down. My buddy's like, you got to give me a month so I can get another manager. Because I told him, hey, I'm going to go try to work it out with Sue. About two weeks into that, I get a call from the girl I'm seeing. She's like, I'm pregnant. So I'm like, what do I do? It's a tough situation. You know what I mean? It's yeah. really tough. Like I can't tell my kids now I'm not coming back, and I gotta tell Sue this now. Um, I told Sue, I said, well, well, "What do you want to do? Because I can't live, you know. I'm not gonna come back and, you know, and be arguing with you all the time about this situation. Yeah, I don't know what to do. I'm like, I was a mess. I was on drugs. I was, you know, I, was, I didn't know what to do. Yeah, but I didn't. I, I there was no way I could tell my two oldest kids I want to come back again. You know what I mean? So, um. She's been real good. She's been great about it. Um, so you came back? I came back, yeah. I went down uh, at least once a month or so. Bro, didn't you have a, a meeting with my dad in his office one time? Yeah, you want to know? That's funny you, thing you said that. Yeah, tell me about that. Um, 
First off, he looked at my hands, and I think he thought of his grandpa. So wait, wait, back up a little bit. Yeah. How did you get into my dad's office? Well, that's just it. See, um, when I came back, um, there was a moment where I thought, uh, no, I can't, I can't do it. I, I didn't want to be around. I didn't want to touch her. I didn't want to do anything, you know? Yeah. And uh, she she convinced me to go up to church, and I, I did. And then she convinced me to meet your dad. And uh, Did you know who my dad was? No, never. I've seen him before in my life. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And she's like, she takes me up there to meet him. And, uh, he, I think the first thing he said was, you're a runner. You're sitting in his office. No, I'm sitting, I'm at the front of the church. No I first way. met him. It was during church, after church service. He's like, you're a runner. And I, I've been fighting my whole life. I've been fighting for my, my whole life. I'm, I'm, I'm down to fight and I've been fighting. I just, I'm messed up. But he's calling me a runner. So I was like, who is this dude? I was mad. You know yeah. what I mean? I was like, man, I don't know this guy. And then, because he turned his back on me after he said it. He wasn't just, he doesn't just say, you're a runner. He goes, you're a runner. And turned his back on me. Oh, my gosh. I was like, Sue? I was looked at her like, what? And then he turned back. He goes, I've been married for blah, 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 so many years. What do you got? I was like, man, who is this dude? Bro. Yeah. My dad is bringing the heat. Yeah, that was 23 years ago. Yeah. And so... um. And then he um, said, do you want my help? And um, I don't know. I think I was maybe one of the last marriage counseling sessions he had because I don't think he does it, right? <laughs> There's a reason why my dad doesn't right. do marriage right. counseling. And so I went in. He was cool, man. He was like. He, he, did you like it? Like, did why did that work for you? The challenge? Yeah. The challenge. Yeah. I'm like, man, this dude don't know who he's talking to. Man, I've been fighting. I've been fighting. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. still here. I've been fighting. So anyways, yeah, he took me into his office and we talked and, uh, you know, he was, he prayed for me. He prayed for something. He, he prayed for something and, and, uh, he, he, what did he pray? He prayed the, uh, he prayed for his mantle it would be on me. And then I heard him in church like 10 years after that say, I can't give my mantle away. <laughs> I need it. What is funny is I was just talking to a pastor before I came in here from Texas yeah. that I met at your dad's school, the prophets back in 2006. He goes, he goes, well, if it comes up, you let him know that he can't give that away. Cause once he gives it away, it's, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> You're just borrowing it right now. This is borrowed it, but I don't have no mantle. So it's just funny. But uh, yeah, your dad helped me out. I mean, he is, uh, if there's a hero on my list, he's number one. Wow. I, I don't have too many, but he's number one. You know what I mean? Uh, I love the guy. Because he gave you something to look at. Yeah. Like he believed in you. Yeah. And um, I get him. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, he's just always been so grateful. I mean, uh, so uh, generous to me. You know, he's given me a lot of work, you know, obviously. And uh, he's just given me a lot of love. You know, he goes, uh, he's get, I mean, um, well, you know, um, I gave my daughter a kidney. Yeah. Right. Tell that story. So your daughter, uh, what's her name? Sorry. Ariel. Ariel. That's right. Yeah. Bro, you have so many. I can't keep it. I know. It's crazy. So your daughter, Ariel got sick. Yeah. Really sick. Really sick. And was like retaining tons of water. Isn't that? Yeah. She gained like a hundred pounds of fluid. And All she's this... only, she's only a hundred pounds anyway. Yes. She's really. Like really... beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful woman. And you yeah. guys find out she has kidney failure. Well, she had lupus. Oh, that's right. Lupus. Yeah. So the, she was doing a bunch of chemo, a bunch of Lasix, and between the, the, the autoimmune and I think the chemo yeah. killed her kidneys. Oh, my God. So she was on dialysis. So it just worked out where I was able to give her a kidney. So, um, but after that was done, there was nobody but your dad. Every day, I think for a month, at least straight, every day. Day he asked how I was doing if yeah. I needed anything. I mean, like, there was nobody in my family doing that. You my dad's I mean? a good friend. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he's number one. I love that. Yeah. So, so here I am. You know what I mean? I've been through a lot. I've been in business for 20 years now. How did you start your electrical business? Um, well, I, uh, I was working for a company in town. And I had five kids at the time, and uh, I was making 15 bucks an hour. And Christmas came and went, 
and um my boss then gave me my boss at the time gave me a fax machine and he gave me guys and I was just running his jobs and then writing out what I was doing and faxing him everything I was doing, you know, fifteen bucks an hour at the time. Yeah. You know, and I was like, okay, but I needed the work. So when Christmas came though, he didn't give me no bonus, no card, no thank you, nothing. So I was like, okay, well, it's not in the he didn't need to anyways. Yeah. You know, I was thankful for the work, but I was like, I'm going to find something better for myself. Yeah. Right. So I told the superintendent down where I was working, Hey, I'm going to be moving on when looking for a job. Well, he told the builder, Hey, Jeff's thinking about moving on. So just so happened that my boss and him got into about something earlier in the day and threatened to pull me off the job site. Right. No way. Yeah. And so the builder calls me and he goes, Hey, uh, how do you feel about working underneath my license and uh, I'm going to sponsor you to get your license and I'll pay you $22 an hour to start. So I was like, <laughs> what was I supposed to do? Bro, what'd you say? There's five kids. Uh, yeah. I, I, don't know. I was like, wow, okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. That's, yes, I have to take it. You know, I felt like the doors were opening up for me. Yeah. Because I was, I, was, I was falling in love with Jesus again, right? And I got back after the whole thing with your dad and I was falling in love with Jesus, right? So things were happening for me a lot, really a lot right then. And it was amazing, such an amazing time. And um, I was so in love with worshiping Jesus. It was like, I would be mad if I didn't get to church on time wow. early, you know what I mean? Because I need to get my, I need to worship. I need to get into worship, you know what I mean? Because I love spending time with Jesus. I used to lay down at night and this crazy feeling would come over me that I can't explain, right? And um I just remember I was worshiping Jesus. I was falling in love with Jesus. And all of a sudden, I seen a vision of Jesus sitting on his throne, and he stood up. I remember just looking up, and I was like basking. I thought, yeah, man. And um, every step he took towards me, he got smaller and smaller until he was my size, looking at me right in the eyes. And he goes, what makes you better than me that I could forgive her, but you can't? Wow. And I was destroyed. I couldn't even, I didn't want to go to church. I, I, I couldn't worship for months. I was toiled with that over and over. Actually, I was like, wow, what am I, what am I doing? She had a whole bunch of unforgiveness towards Sue. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was tough. And that was something else. That really, that really hit me hard. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, I'm not better than you, Jesus. You know? Was that your catalyst to like some of the healing and the forgiveness? Yeah, man. I had to deal with that. And then things really took off as far as uh, supernatural stuff. Some pretty wild stuff. Your dad was teaching uh, on the language of the spirit at the time. And uh, I started noticing that a lot. I had birds following me. I'm not kidding, man. I'm like, well, things are tripping out. <laughs> I, I mean, I ended up in Arizona with my two best friends, and they gave their lives to God there. Let me tell you about that real quick. Yeah, I do. You, know, I, you know, I was like, God was sending me to Arizona. I don't know why. Everything was Arizona, Arizona. I remember the night she was pregnant. She wanted ice cream. So I went to leave my house, and there was a cop pulled over a car in front of my driveway. And the cars from Arizona, I know, the slices play. And everything I was noticing was Arizona. Yeah, go to the store. I get my, go back. And I, and I remember uh, it was basketball season. I turn on the TV, and the very first commercial was Want to Get Away? Okay. Fly to Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> right? So I'm like, okay, that's trippy. So I turned the channel and there was Benny Hinn, right? I used to watch TVN yeah. at the time. Oh, yeah. And I didn't like the guy. Yeah. I thought he was a weirdo. I thought he was a fake growing <laughs> up with J-Dub. You know, you're not into this stuff. It's all weird, right? And so I'm like, it's Benny Hinn. The very first words out of his mouth was, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you don't want to miss my next crusade in Phoenix, Arizona. Just like that. And I said, that's it, Sue. I'm going. I'm going to go. I got up right then. I booked a flight. No way. Yeah. I said, I've never been to Phoenix. I don't know where I'm going. And um, I'm going to go see this dude. I'm going to prove two things. If God's really sending me there and if this guy's for real or he's fake. Wow. Right? And so there was a lot of stuff going on with my two best friends. And, uh, you know, it was like a month or two before his crusade. I couldn't have coerced this. I couldn't have asked him nothing. And so much stuff was going on with my two friends. I don't think we have enough time for all that. Um, one of them said, Hey, I'm going to pick up Ray and we're, we're, I'm going to meet you out there. I'm like, these are the guys I did nothing but dirt with. Like they're going to meet me at a crusade, crusade, Benny, Hinn crusade. Benny Hinn crusade, you know? And, uh, so we went there and, um, it started waiting for service to start and never started. We worshiped for eight hours. 
It was just an eight-hour worship service with intermission of people getting healed and getting out of the wheelchairs. Did was Benny my, there? Benny was there. I saw the first miracle. This lady was like, it was an oval arena, and there was a big line, and this one lady was turned around worshiping backwards, and she had this big thing on her stomach, and I was like, I noticed her. Half hour later, she's on stage crying, and it's gone. And I, I was like, I seen it. Like, I was totally like, all of a sudden, I was believing like something I've never, you know, I was like, wow. I seen I seen a little kid with these walking things, took it off. And, you know, I don't know if you know Donnie McClurklin, but he was there. He told yeah. a great testimony. It was so powerful that even Benny Hinn's right-hand man was like, I have the video. He's like, whoa, can you feel the spirit here tonight? It was just so powerful. It was so thick in the atmosphere. It was thick in there, you know? And then he did an altar call, and my two boys gave their lives to Jesus, and the welcome to the family. And my buddy that was going through everything was just bawling. You know, it's a, it's a long story. I don't know. I'm skipping through a lot, you know, but God sent Ray there that night because his sister died that night from overdose, and he was going to be parting with them, but he went and gave his life to oh Jesus. Oh, my gosh. It just reminds me of the authority, you know, the cop pulling over my drive. There's just so much. I have so much to talk about in that. You know, there's so many things going on with the language of the Spirit. He sent me to Montana. That's an hour, hour long testimony. Wow. Yeah. And, and then back to Arizona and stuff. And it was pretty wild, man. Ended up at TVN down there, just nobody in the building, walking through the green room, going upstairs, seeing all these old artifacts, these biblical, you know, all this really cool stuff he never really gets close to and then jan comes out hey boys you hungry you want something to eat you remember jan right no, jan kraut dude no. she had this big pink hair so she's like <laughs> what just paul paul and jan kraut started tbn wow right so it was there's a lot going on but i was going the supernatural was just flowing like yeah right then like i could feel it right now because i'm talking about it because you know Pastor Bill says, you know, yeah. testimony means to be, to do again. Yeah, right? it's a spirit of prophecy. Right. So, but there's a lot going on. So a lot happened, right? And it was really wild because I was at your dad's house, what, about three, four years ago when um, Benny Hinn's son-in-law. Um, yeah, Michael. Michael, right? Yeah. He was there. Yeah. And uh, I got the nerve up to ask him who his dad was because your dad was like, hey, what's it like being the son of a famous preacher? And I was like, well, who's your dad? He's like, oh, Benny Hinn. And I was like, oh, yeah, I went to his crusade in 2004. Uh, he's like, were you there? I'm like, yeah. He goes, I was there too. I was like, remember Donnie McClurkin's testimony? Yeah, man, with the three Jewish doctors. <laughs> yeah, man. We, we started vibing right there because of that. You know, it was so powerful. Yeah. And years later, right? Like 20 years later almost. So it's like, wow, that was so cool. Yeah. So it's uh, it's been a wild ride. My life's been, you know? Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. I still go on through things. Yeah. You know, I just had a daughter move out on me yesterday with a boy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's life. <laughs> you yeah. know, um, it's still challenging. Yeah. You know, so, but um, I how love did, them. How did you, I mean, you grew up in a home where you didn't have, you didn't really have a father. Yeah. And the father figure that you did have was abusive. Mm hmm and horrible. And I mean, just so many, so many cards stacked against you, you know? How did you get to a place where like, you figured out how to show up at home and show up for your wife and uh, I, love your kids? Like, how did you get there? Man, you know, I, I've, uh, I, my whole life, if, to be honest, I, I like, I, I act hard a lot, you know, I put on this thing, but I, I from birth, I've had this love in me. Absolutely. That I, that, um, that got kind of beat down into me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was this big kid ball of love that just wanted to love everybody. Everybody was my best friend. You know what I mean? I wanted that, but it just didn't go that way. So I don't know. I just, um, my kids, like I said, my, my, my oldest daughter pretty much when I saw her looking out that window, you know, triggered and, uh, put everything back and uh and then jesus of course his grace you know and uh everything is my life's a miracle it is a miracle. you know I, I, like i said I, I heard bullets flying by my head and you can hear them you know you hear the zing like they're like loaded springs oh yeah ding ding you know what i mean you can yeah. hear that stuff going by so um i don't know it's just it's been a while i think 
yeah, Jesus saved me because there's some miracles in my life. You know, uh, he, he wanted me to, I think, to raise these daughters. I mean, I haven't done the best job because um, my problem with raising my daughters, to be honest, is like I, I, I don't know the middle. That's that's where I'm lost. That's the middle. Where, that's like, where, where I've been like lost. Like 14 to 18? No, like um, like too nice and too mad. Oh, yeah. I don't have that nurturing middle. Yeah. And uh, my kids will tell you, it's like, I, I, I should have been harder, but I'm afraid of me. Yeah. So it's easier to stay on the, that side of being mad, you know, whether they needed it. Yeah. And so Sue helped, you know, cause Sue don't have a problem with that. <laughs> Sue don't oh. have a problem with that. But it would have been better if I, I had that in me yeah but that didn't happen because you would you were way too lenient like way too, too lenient too lenient yeah you know i mean way, that's the problem pretty, yeah you know i mean you and sue are a good balance yeah because sue can definitely bring the heat yes everybody's afraid of her yeah i yeah. love her but yeah. i mean she's she's amazing she is and you're amazing because you're just you are you're just so compassionate you have so much compassion which is part of what broke you as a kid you know in the sense of like i mean when you're just a ball of love and you get beat up forever that's that's tough but with with kids man kids are tough i mean i struggle with my kids yeah it's really hard it is it's not easy yeah but especially when they know your past yeah. Then you become hypocritical if you do or say anything against what they're doing. Yeah. I, I've I've gotten that. Yeah. You know what I mean? They yeah. know my past. So. Yeah. I mean, the, the good thing is, is that you can't change the past, but you can own it and mm -hmm. clean it up, mm -hmm. you know, like you did. Yeah. Which helps you. My dad always says that forget, uh, repentance restores the standard. Mm. So it's like. Yeah, I did all that stuff. That's yeah. why I'm telling you not to. Yeah. Because there's pain down there. There is. There really is. You know, I I shook the dove off. You know, I, 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 I kind of screwed up, you know, and I, I've come clean about it. I, I think you were there and I came clean about it, but I haven't. And um, I shook the dove off. I'm trying to... Uh, Michael said the devil is going to land on my shoulder again. I'm waiting for that. You shook the dove off? Uh -huh. I think that was a passive bill thing. Um, I, I, I'm not kidding. I, there was, I was walking so close with God at a point. It almost became a burden. Mm, explain that. Um, discerning. Discerning a lot, if it's me or the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It got heavy on me. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're like I wasn't trying. I didn't want to force. I didn't want. There was so much going on that when things seemed like when the Holy Spirit wasn't working around me, I, I almost started try to make it work around me when yeah. it wasn't the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? And um, I don't know. After that, you know, like I said, I screwed up. You know, I came clean with the Sue and everything, and and we moved on. But I, I haven't been back, and I don't know how to get there. I feel a lot. I know I'm saying when I get around, uh, like I get, I don't want to fall again. It's a far fall. Yeah. I, I still see the vision of me. I remember me when I, when, when I decided to do what I did, I remember seeing me pushing myself off the shore into a crazy windstorm on the ocean. And I feel like I've been out there ever since. And it's been a while now. And I've been, you know, lately I've been, you know, been about a year and a half ago now. I called your dad and I said, like, "Hey, I just don't want a church or nothing." And he invited me. That's when he invited me. And that's about a year and a half now. I've been coming back. Yeah. And, he's, and he told me, you know, your obedience will turn into passion, and that's why I keep going. But I haven't had the passion right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everything I'm doing right now is out of obedience. But um, man, I don't know how to get get through the passion part again. You know what I mean? I don't know. I'm at the same time. I fear of falling because that's a far fall. Yeah. So that's kind of like where I'm at now. You know, Carl, I love you so much. You know what I'm saying? You're so honest. So, Tom, 
I'm just I'm just living this life, man. It's been a wild ride. For me too. Yeah. And I appreciate you. You know, I mean, you came up to me, I don't know how many years ago, and handed me a, a bow of the year, 2006 Bowtech bow of the year. I mean, <laughs> who does that? You know, I, I, everybody comes over, yeah, man, look at my bow. I don't know how to shoot it, but look at my <laughs> bow. You know what I mean? That's pretty cool. We got to teach you how to shoot that. Yeah. Thing. Well, you did. You, we went out with some memory and we stacked those yeah. pins. Tell me how to stack the pins and yeah. stuff. So I did a little bit, but. Um, you know, I think. It's it's interesting. Like uh, you remember when you were dating, how exciting it was to date. Yeah, and how exciting it was to be with your wife. You know, and then you get married, and you get busy, and yeah. and 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 then there's these little things along the way. There's disappointments. There's frustrations. There's there's things that you hope for that didn't happen. All that stuff. And it's easy to get in, into being marriage and <clears throat> to lose that passion. Not the the love to me is the commitment. Passion is like the emotion behind it, you know. And I think the same thing happens when when we go through those seasons in life with God that were so incredible. Is you're, we're passionate because everything's new. I'm learning, I'm growing. There's <clears throat> I'm pursuing something, right? Every day something can happen. I'm ex- I'm expecting, I'm hoping. But then if you're not careful, these different pain points build up and your hopes get hurt and broken and you quit searching, you quit you quit partnering with God and you quit hoping and you quit looking. And and I think it's that piece where when you when you get hurt you often get hopeless and to me like he who has the most hope wins i mean that that's life if you don't have any hope do you get out of bed and work hard no hmm. do you yeah. do you come back home to your family no do you uh, pursue something bigger no if you don't have any hope right like you just don't do anything and so i think a lot a lot in my life the areas the places where i don't have hope anymore because i had some sort of pain or some sort of offense until i really solve that piece like the pain and the offense and i don't really allow myself to hope in that area anymore and it's something to think about you know mm-hmm. i think the other piece too is that sometimes sometimes we get capped in our life like uh, well i i see it a lot and even i experience it too myself mm-hmm. where going to church is gets really boring like really boring and i remember being 13 and telling my dad i don't want to go to church anymore which was not an easy conversation to have with my dad yeah right yeah, I remember him looking at me and he said, well, why? And I was trying to convince him, you know? So I said, ah, oh, the preaching's boring. He hates boring preaching. The worship's really bad. Homeless people come in all the time. And he said, oh, son, it sounds like you're going for yourself. Mm. Yeah. And I thought he was saying, it's good to go for yourself. I'm 13. Right. And I said, yeah, dad, I think I am. Right. And he said, son, look at me. He said, going to church for yourself is the lowest level of living as a Christian. And I felt, I felt this big. Yeah. I felt so small, but then he came back to me and he said, Hey, people need you. They need what you have. I want you to go to, I want you to go to youth group and find someone that needs what you have. That's where I, that's literally where I learned counseling. Because from 13 years old on, I just thought that that's what people did. Like I was on a mission. When I went to youth group, I was on a mission. I was going to find that kid that was hurting and then help him. I mean, I didn't have any tools. I didn't know that you needed tools. Yeah, right. I just kind of like you in electrical, you Mm -hmm. just started. And once you start, like you didn't go to high school, like you didn't know that like you're supposed to. And, but I just started with people and I found that like 
that's where I really came alive. That's where I felt like I was making a difference. That's where I felt a ton of purpose. And so sometimes I think it's the offense piece because I get hurt. And then the other side of that is like, if I just go for 20 years, but I'm not, I'm not like pouring myself, like I'm not going on a mission, then it, I'm just going to get excited. Like I'm just yeah. waiting for something to get me excited. And there's nothing about church that's exciting enough to keep me there for, unless I'm on a mission. Like yeah. when the disciples went with Jesus at first, they watched him do it. And it was really cool, you know, because they're watching Jesus mm -hmm. do all these miracles. And then they do it with him, right? He's like, hey, pass out this food. Hey, you know, um, carry this stuff. Hey, do this stuff. And they, so they did it with him. But there came a point where they didn't watch Jesus do it anymore, where he sent them out, where they did it. And so I think sometimes for me, I'm talking to me as much as I'm talking to you and every other guy on here. It's like when I get into the mode of where I'm looking, where I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking for God to make it fun for me. I realize like, that's not how it works. It's never worked for me. When I get back into the mode, the sweet spot, like, is sweet spot for us is like, what does God want to do through you? Like, how does he want to use your life today? And I think that's the big adventure. That's what was so exciting about going to Arizona. Yeah. Is what God was doing through you and with you. That was what was so exciting about going to Montana. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes we got to go back to see like, where did I lose that? what was the pain that came in or what was the lie or what was the, and maybe it was in your, um, you know, in the burden of trying to figure out what the Holy Spirit was doing. And is it me or is it him? And maybe, that, maybe there was a painful place there or something, but going back to like, where did I quit being on a mission with God? Because everything else is just, you're back to being a Jehovah's witness. Yeah. You're back to like, trying to keep a bunch of rules and i'm not slamming those people i'm just saying like we're back to sitting in church yeah instead of like back to going to get equipped going to be a to to like okay i'm going to work i'm it's the guy who goes to work every day <clears throat> and he's not trying to better himself he's just trying to get a paycheck it's like man eventually after that like if you go to work every day and you just go to work every day and you don't try to learn a new skill. You don't have a goal. There's no goal, right? Like you don't, you don't try and like take on more ownerships, more responsibilities so you can grow in the company. You don't do any of that stuff. You just go to work every day. Pretty soon you're complaining about work. Mm. It's not fun. It's boring. Pretty much. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I do. I'm living it. Yeah. But it's different, right? Like remember when you started your company? Oh yeah. It was different. You had goals, right? Yeah. You're like what could I do? Where yeah. could I go? What could I, I could hire some guys. If I get more jobs and I do it efficiently, I could bid for, you know, like you start to think and then you watch money coming in, you're taking care of your family. It's this big adventure doing something you've never done before. So I think guys like you and me, and this is just my opinion, but guys like you and me, when we stop, when we stop being on a mission and you stop dreaming, it, life isn't fun enough. And, you, and then you look, we just look for something better, something that is going to make us happy, something that's, do you know what I mean? Mm, no, I do. I'm living it. Yeah. Bro, I've been there so many times, honestly. Yeah. I am. Um, I know we got to end soon. Yeah. But I did a whole stretch. So I, from um, probably 2015 to 2018, I just, felt so down every day i felt so down and i was really frustrated and angry there was a bunch of church stuff that felt really political that just really turned me off there was i didn't like the job that i had i didn't like the role that i was in i had a whole bunch of complaints right and pain and frustration i was still working through my nervous breakdown that i've been you know happened in in 2000 uh 2009 
Like, you know, I've been four years working through a nervous breakdown, just a lot of pain, five years. And I remember um, I would sleep in till like eight, nine o'clock. I wouldn't really work hard. You know, it was just that. Yeah, right. And I remember one day, um, you know how you ever had like, you're walking around and all of a sudden, like you just have a revelation. Yeah, I didn't have that thought before. I was just walking in my garage and I was just so down and, and depressed. And um, all of a sudden it, I, it dawned on me that I was breaking my promises. I was breaking all my promises. And I, I remember thinking through like, I don't like me because I don't wake up on time. I don't take care of myself. I complain about my job. Like I'm not trying to improve. I'm not trying to grow. I'm not picking targets. I'm just like doing. And I walked in and this is what I told the Lord. Literally, I said, babe, I have so much shame because I'm breaking my own promises. I'm like 204 pounds, you know, for which for me, like I'm not six foot four, you know? Yeah. I'd have to grow for that to be okay. I was like fat. I was embarrassed to take my shirt off in front of my wife. I was just how I felt. Like every time we make love, I'm like, can we turn the lights down, Dimmer? <laughs> you know, I'm eating yeah. ice cream every night before I go to bed, right. which is like great if, if you're doing all the other stuff. But I was told her like, I feel so much shame about me because I'm breaking all my promises. It, I didn't start by breaking my promise. I started by, I started by getting into a position in my job, which I didn't feel like I was thriving. I started letting the politics at work, like it was really affecting me. Instead of processing it, hearing God's voice on it, seeing what my part was it, and leaving the rest to God, like I didn't do that. Do you know what I mean? I just got bitter. Yeah, bitter. And for me, I had to come back to go like, I literally, that was like, I had to draw a line in the sand. And that's when I started to go like, what's in my heart? That's when I started to, that's the the first of Braveco event, which wasn't called Braveco. That's when God started telling me, I want you to give me something I can bless. Mm. And I was terrified. Yeah. Because I didn't, I didn't know how to do it. But it, like for a whole year, he told me, I want you to give me something I can bless. What was he doing? He was challenging me because I was now like able to listen. It was like my dad saying, you're a runner. Yeah. Right. God was telling me like, I want you to give me something I can bless. And that's when I did the first event at the Wildcatter Ranch in Graham, Texas, and guys showed up and I was surprised. But that's when I quit breaking my promises. And it's like every time I get back to the place where I quit, where I break my own promises, I get back into that place of life where I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what life's about. I feel lost. I feel empty. Do you know what I mean? I do. So maybe that'll help. That does help. That's where I'm at. Yeah. Bro, I love you so much. I love you too. I just want to say, you know, I know I talked about Sue and stuff in the past, but, you know, nobody's innocent here. So I don't know. Bro, Sue's, you know what I mean? Sue's one of the best women yeah, that I know. She's a good woman. She's a great mom. She's a good woman. We have a great marriage right now. So she's incredible. Yeah. That's why I had you on here because your life is such an inspiration, you know? And there's so many men that grew up in a home that it was unfair. I mean, we, were, we weren't designed to grow up in a home that, where there's a bunch of pain and a bunch of chaos and a bunch of suffering. And the fact that like you made it out of that and then like you did a whole bunch of it wrong, you know, you, you, if you could go back and redo it, you would. I would, yeah. But then to watch God, to watch God, like turn your life around. And I love that we even talked about this at the end because there's no man that's listening to this that hasn't walked that same journey as you, even where you're at right now in, in coming back around, like you've been back for a year and a half and pursuing, like I remember when my dad went through his nervous breakdown, I don't know, maybe it's 12 years ago or 13 years ago. And he laid on the couch for six months like a shell of himself. Mm. I remember standing outside of his home that he's in right now and him telling me like, I just, I don't know if 
God's real. I don't know if, uh, like he was so low. Hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I understand and, that. And I just remember telling my dad, like, you, you're going to make it through this. I know where you're at. Like, you're going to make it through this. Like, these aren't bad times. These are the times that, that these are just times where we have to make these key critical decisions of who am I going to be? What decisions am I going to make? Like, where am I going to go? And, but you've always been that man. Like you've always, you've always been able to write the ship, get to a place where you clean up your mess and like take control of your life and move forward. That's how you have seven kids that you raised that you provided for. That's why you have a wife that, I mean, you guys should have a terrible marriage, but you have a great marriage because you worked hard mm -hmm. and she worked hard. And I really admire that out of you. Right on. Yeah. Thanks, man. You know, I love you. I love you, bro. Yeah, I love you too. Thanks for coming in and talking with us. Yeah, for sure. Brave Co Men, I hope that Jeff's story inspires you this week and that you take a look at your life, right? And the places that you've struggled. And I love stories like this because it takes away the excuses. We all, uh, even including myself, like we all wish that we had uh, different circumstances and and different things in our life. But when you look at someone like Jeff, you look at a, a young man that didn't have a dad in his life who loved him, who worked through abuse, who made a bunch of poor decisions, who jumped in a gang, who all he knew was chaos, but the power of God gripping his life and turning him around and giving him something to fight for and giving him something to live for. And like, that's what we're all doing. We're all in the same boat together, fighting and, and growing and building a life that we're proud of because of the power of God, because of what God's done in us. So maybe just sit back today and reflect on what God's done in your life and how you can jump into his mission that he has for you. We'll see you next week. Hey, Brave Co Men, hopefully you loved this week's episode. Listen, if you have not subscribed to our podcast, you are already behind. Go ahead and click right here to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have not watched last week's episode, you can click right here and watch last week's episode. And listen, if you want to upgrade your wardrobe, you can check out some of our new hats that we have in stock and all our other swag. Go to braveco.org and you can look at our store there. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.